Anastasia Salter, an Associate Professor of English at the University of Central Florida. And along with my collaborator, Jason Nelson, who unfortunately can't join us today, I curated the Climates of Change exhibition. We are so excited to bring this collection virtually to the fall for the book. Our conversation about it really began in January 2020, uh, spurred by the fires raging in Jason's home of Australia and the widespread fears for the future, which would only amplify as this process went on. The moment really demanded self-reflection for us. At the time, uh, we were involved in planning the Electronic Literature Organization Conference, a yearly event that gathers scholars, writers, and artists from around the world to celebrate experiments in born digital literature. If you're unfamiliar with electronic literature as a term, you're probably encountered it in the wild. Electronic literature is a practice of re-envisioning and revisioning literary through the digital. So if you've played a tune your, your own adventure style game, read a hypertext story or novel, interacted with or laughed at a procedural Twitter bot, maybe one generating fake headlines or random story fragments or memes, explored a work of endless poetry across a web page, played a literary game, or encountered a fictional character drawing you into stories on an imaginary world on TikTok or YouTube, you've been in the space of electronic literature. Frequently, what we notice about electronic literature is how it changes with it when we interact with it. Some works are games or game-like, requiring us to interact to move forwards. Others generate things on their own or move or progress with or without intervention but draw on underlying algorithmic mechanisms that create patterns from which unexpected meaning emerges, which is just another way of saying that sometimes what we create is so much a collaboration with the computer uh, that we don't know quite what will come out from it either. As a community of people studying, experimenting, making, and teaching electronic literature, we've long been cognizant of the disconnect between the values we express through this type of work and the real environmental impact of the technological in the form digital. We rely so much on quickly replaced platforms destined for landfills in the hands of planned to obsolescence. I mean, think about it. How often do you replace a Game Boy, a cell phone, a laptop? And of course, our community has been enabled just like this one through bringing people together in physical spaces at the cost of countless miles of air travel and of course, we all, both in this conversation and, and in the work we create, are dependent upon the resource consuming practices of cloud computing and distributed servers, which we know have consequences um, across our world. Now, when we were discussing bringing together electronic literature with a discussion of climate change through the literary in January, we didn't know that these tensions and challenges would only escalate. I was still planning on hosting an in-person conference. And I imagine the organizers of Fall for the Book similarly had a very different fall in mind. With a global pandemic demanding rapid change in the face of communal devastation, we all needed to reflect upon our work through this new lens. It was in this moment that Jason Nelson and I wrote and launched the call for Climates of Change, a request for authors and artists working in these born digital methods to engage in the global challenges through the lens of the personal, to challenge and inspire us, and to push for much needed reflection and change. We hoped through this process to gather works that would serve as a reminder of how the digital can reconnect us to the natural. And through these spaces of interaction, generation, and collaboration, perhaps ignite sparks of change. These creators from around the world will be joining us virtually to introduce their work today. The resulting electronic literature selected from the call and included in this exhibition that we hope you'll explore today, demonstrate the range of what this type of born digital storytelling can look like. Some of the works engage locally with the very conditions that led to our initial conversations. Prosthetics for a changing climate invites us into imaginary interventions on behalf of Australian wildlife caught in the devastating fires and engaging with the international discussion of protective equipment, but through a very different lens. Shelter in place. It is no longer safe to evacuate. 
cover up all doors and windows, and remain in a damp, sheltered place if possible. As the fire goes over you, it will become very dark, very hot, and very loud. My name is Alinta, and this is the Government Fire Department message I received on my phone on the day that I evacuated from last year's fires. The fire emergency in Australia lasted from September 2019 through to about February 2020. During that time, over one billion lives were lost, not including the many birds, bats, reptiles or marine creatures who died. Images emerged of charred wallabies stuck up against rural fences unable to escape, possum mothers dying protecting newborn joeys, and barely surviving koalas crying as their feet burnt on the hot ash that blanketed their world. How do we process such loss of non-human kin, and how do we begin to innovate a future that helps them? Prosthetics for a Changing Climate is an interactive imagining that allows the user to design personal protective equipment for unique Australian wildlife, to keep fire and smoke at bay during bushfires. With certain combinations of PPE, recombinatory stories appear on screen that tell the true story of this bushfire from my perspective. By using a digital platform to tell this story, I can more actively engage the reader in the kinds of interactivity that this piece requires, such as allowing the reader to choose and design for themselves through touch, and allowing the recombinant text that appears and floats away, and allowing the sounds that play in the background. Made for portrait orientation on the smart device, this work can be read at any scale using a touchable interface. The Rescue Project engages with a similar moment through a very different method, inviting us into co-authorship through a space of telling stories around relationships of Australian wildlife and land. Hi, I'm Gretchen Miller and this is The Rescue Project. It's a project that I love because it brings to the public intimate, heartfelt stories from so-called ordinary people, people who are quietly going about everyday acts of environmental rescue. And this is slow rescue, not moments of individual heroics. This is about time and commitment, unique tales of what it's like to dig your fingers in the dirt or look into the eyes of an animal you've cared for and will release. Slowly, over weeks or years, replant secret gullies or fight for the protection of one little creek in the wilderness from mining or logging. All this in the face of the global climate catastrophe. And the essential ingredients of such rescues well, my research and analysis reveals two common graces, those of humility and of courage. I hope the generous intimacy of these stories will touch you. You can read them or listen to some of them. We invite you to dip in and enjoy. Similarly situated in time and place, climatophosis it draws our attention to the changes in rainfall in Nigeria through visual digital poetry, a moving, frantic visual experience that draws us in to potential crisis. Oh, welcome to the Fall for the Books Festival 2020. My name is Walia Johanna Joseph. I am the author of Climatophosis. And climatophysis, as the name implies, is coined from two words, climate and metamorphosis, which is climate change. And this climate change affected everywhere in the world. When you read the text, climatophysis, you discover that everything is moving. The texts are moving, the glaciers are melting, the water level in the sea and the ocean are rising, and even the maps of the world are shaking. It means that everywhere is affected by climate change. And this is the source of my inspiration to write this digital point. I would like you to read it and enjoy yourself and have a fun. Thank you for reading it in advance. Other authors found their inspiration in the collective experience of change as the pandemic shutdowns began. The infinite catalog of crushed dreams uses generated text to invite us to contemplate snapshots of shared loss. 
I'm Mark Sample, the creator of the Infinite Catalog of Crushed Dreams. I made the work in April 2020, when the vast implications of the coronavirus shutdown were just becoming obvious. The Infinite Catalog of Crushed Dreams imagines countless events and opportunities that were ruined by the coronavirus, from high school proms to canceled weddings, from playground crushes to devastated retirement accounts. This piece could only be made and experienced in digital form. The list of crushed dreams truly is endless. With its implementation of infinite scrolling, you can scroll for hours without seeing a repeated entry in the catalog. There are billions of possible combinations. The work dwells on the local and the personal, identifying fictional people by name throughout real locations across the United States. The crush dreams likewise are described with exacting precision. It's an attempt to personalize a crisis so vast that it threatens to elude comprehension. This catalog of crush dreams is a paradox. It calls attention to the individuated anguish of people through the aesthetics of the mathematical sublime. The work is US centric, but that's not because I was ignoring the broken hopes that to this day occur daily around the globe. It's because this work is ultimately about my friends, my students, my family, my own children, and their own dreams, hopes, and aspirations. Procedural work of this kind is different every time we experience it. It invites you to revisit and note the patterns, but also the emergence. Similarly, engaging with the American experience of crisis in 2020 through a political lens, Liberty Ring offers us another generative text and call to action. Liberty Ring lets every reader ring the Liberty Bell because we believe everyone needs to ring an alarm around the big three, democracy, climate and the sea, online abuse of attention and trust. A republic, if you can keep it. Data, the new oil. Change ringing, the ringing of bells in mathematical patterns rather than randomly or in tunes. The president has left us no choice. Nearly 20% of the human genome is now privately owned. 40 lightning strikes a minute. You will generally observe that of all Americans, your foreign born citizens are the most patriotic. Liberty Ring is based on ringing the changes. A print book produced from the code based on the ancient art of tower bell ringing. It uses the words of Frederick Douglass, Ben Franklin, framers of the Constitution, and many more whose concern is democracy and threats to it. You can play Liberty Ring and find out more about both projects at stephaniestrickland.com. Also relying on this type of generative poetics are what we might call the poetry of code. Dueling Rain's poems explore the tensions of experiencing and fearing simultaneously for the natural world, an experience that has become all too familiar as we into our increased hurricanes here in Florida and the terrible spread of wildfires throughout the West Coast. And of course, the global incidents already mentioned uh, deal of an escalating crisis. Hi, I'm Steve DiPaolo. I'm a cognitive scientist who computer models creativity. I'm also a practicing artist. And in this case, I wrote a series of poems, I should say, I coded an artificial intelligence system that generated a series of poems called Dueling Rain, a generative AI poem space. I was originally from New York City, and now I live up in North Vancouver. Um, and in New York, I used to love when I was young to go out into the rain. It was so life affirming. I would just walk around. I realize now as I'm older with climate change that that same rain is also life taking, that there'll be floods and mass migration of people having to leave their homes. So I wrote a series of poems using generated AI to look through that. So let me just show you what I did. So I tweaked the system where in fact, I could give it a prompt. So I started with the prompt, love rain on me. 
And that generated a rather life-affirming poem. And from that, I took a line from that poem, the rain fell softly upon the wet rain. And that generated now a series of poems that were both life-affirming and life-taking. And I continue doing that. Here's to the beauty of the rain I took from one line. And I kept going on and on through the different levels. So this is my system. I would like you to look at it. It's both talking about climate change, rain, and artificial intelligence generation. Thank you. Several of the works in the collection ask you to interact with this crisis. They use mechanics you might recognize from games to draw attention to topics that we don't see much in mainstream video games. For instance, response emphasizes care and community in a pandemic world. Hello there, I'm Plunk, a budget cyborg, otherwise known as a disabled person. You may also just call me Sophie. There's me in the corner, reacting to the sound of my own voice as I'm playing my own game. I made this work response, in response to the COVID-19 response. I was feeling really disconnected at the beginning of the year, as I'm sure most of us were. Um, and the internet was an excellent resource for keeping in touch with our loved ones to fabricate some sense of connection or intimacy. Um, I think there was this huge sense of irony for me from the outcry people online whose right to navigate the public sphere and earn money was largely taken away from them, um, an experience that is almost synonymous with being disabled. In this game now, I think on our welfare system and how even though hundreds of thousands of people have been forced to engage with it for the first time, they can still hold contempt for those who it's meant to support. Instead, we buy into this garbage we're fed about dull bludges while our planet is hollowed dry by grifters, all the while people continue to fall through the cracks. Um, it gets tiring to reach out to people and ask them to care. So this game is for thinking on purpose in a time of increasing segregation, uh, a desire to connect and be felt, to feel included in the crowd. Similarly, I look but I can't see, draws on the aesthetics of retro gaming to explore the nature of reality during a moment of sudden difficult change through surreal dreamlike landscapes of play. Hi, my name is Rachel Donnelly, and my piece is I Look But I Can't See, a bitsy game exploring the nature of reality through dreams, memories, and visual perception. We live now in a time of constant unrest and uncertainty. Intensified as the concepts of truth and fact are called into question, the lines that define them are continually blurred. This increasingly unreal state of the world, and my own personal reflections on reality, are the inspiration behind this piece. I Look But I Can't See is born digital, using the online editor Bitsy, which allows you to make games and narrative experiences that export easily to the web. Bitsy was an ideal format for this for two main reasons. First, Bitsy is comprised of minimalist constraints such as a limited color palette, where only three colors are visible on the screen at a time. These helped me refine and express the aspects of reality I wanted players to explore. Second, Bitsy made it simple to make and export a game easily played in a web browser. Its basic interaction, where players navigate with only arrow keys, helped make it an even more accessible experience, bringing more players closer to the ideas I have to share. And Trail offers two games drawing on personal experiences of natural parks in the author's home of Florida, asking visitors to reflect on what they destroy when they appreciate nature. Hello everyone, my name is Alex Boyd. I am a digital media MA student at the University of Central Florida and I am presenting my project trail website. So this project includes two interactive experiences designed in Twine and Bitsy. And these games are focused on the high volume foot traffic issues that are experienced by national parks year after year and the damages that it causes. And these are the kinds of damages that national parks struggle to afford to repair 
and protect from getting even worse. I found that the online presentation of this project was the perfect way to introduce people to this topic. On the site, you can play the two games, read up about the issues surrounding our national parks, and even donate to the National Parks Department if you feel so inclined. So, please enjoy. Bringing play on a much larger scale, Terrarium asked its players to step into imagining collectively an environmental future through an alternate reality game. Envisions form as something like a scavenger hunt or escape room spread across the campus, as the following trailer shows. Global warming. Totalitarianism. Climate change. Everything from online documents, puzzles, student videos, reverse escape room, faculty videos. We really thought about it as like a live action role playing game. I was on a group chat. We were communicating around the world. There was a ton of different puzzles. And it also got harder when it went to uh, the live stream. Players were interacting in real time with a live actor. We watched those frames very carefully. And I think it broke the game. It helped me make friends. I came to the right university. This is the most new Chicago thing to do. Another collaboration at scale, but online through a form of shared storytelling called NetProv, Destination Wedding 2070 invited its participants to imagine the future 50 years out drawing on models of climate prediction to populate the data of their shared fictional world. Destination Wedding is a dark comedy about wedding planning 50 years from now, and spoiler alert, climate change is the ultimate wedding crasher. The data for this data dramatization netprov has been brought to you by Earth Games and was based on simulations of the weather that have been modeled by the labs of Dargan Frierson. Uh, this game was created in collaboration with Rob Wittig, myself, Mark Marino, and Samara Haley Steele, also with Dargan Frierson, in order to help our participants imagine how weather change would affect perhaps the, the most important day of their life. In the process of creating these models of the future, we picked five locations and five different days on which uh, not just the climate would have changed dramatically, but that the weather would be an interesting factor. In addition to creating the dossiers, we also computer generated wedding parties in some uh, perfectly Montague and Capulet-esque families about to be married and participants, players, chose which characters they would play as this drama unfolded. Flighty parent of Avery, moody parent of Emily, vengeful best friend. They would play out these characters by writing secret diary entries over on a Reddit board. Well, I guess they were public secret diary entries as they played out eight pivotal beats in a traditional wedding, usually comedy or travesty scenario. Uh, entering in how the weather was imp impacting every moment of their wedding adventure. Rob and I also crashed several of these, and I will say the food was delicious. Meanwhile, monstrous weather offers a more personal way to explore NetProf, adapting the shared storytelling around changing climates to hypertext, allowing it to live on in this exhibition in a playable form. So this piece I'm going to be showing you is a hypertext remixing of a netprov that was run by uh, Mark Marino and Rob Whitted about uh, four years ago. The stories that formed the basis for this remix evolved over a number of weeks uh, in a Google group and were told by a large group of participants. Now a netprov or a networked improvisation is a way of using existing digital media in combinations to create fake characters who pretend to do things in the real world. They induce a moment of vertigo where people don't quite know whether it's real or not now, the underlying motivation behind doing a netprov is to really evoke a sense of laughter, insight, and hopefully empathy. Monstrous Weather was a netprov that took place in July and August 2016. The premise was basically that one week the internet went down. So without any internet, what can we do but sit around and tell stories? So the stories gradually evolved in a Google group. Uh, what was most interesting about it was that they started off as simple sort of uh, one-off stories told by people around the world. And gradually, there was a sense of connection developing between those stories. That was something I saw as very interesting, uh, something which I wanted to make use of 
and tried to sort of weave together into a hypertext. So there was something about these stories, the way they were starting to connect, they seemed to be at least thematically coherent um, and maybe even hinting at some sort of a narrative. There was also something about them that somehow demanded retelling. This constant desire to remix and adapt reminds me of uh, Linda Hutchins' uh, words uh, where she says, uh, the fundamental appeal of literary adaptation comes simply from repetition with vari variation, from the comfort of ritual combined with the piquancy of surprise. Recognition and remembrance are part of the pleasure and risk. So too is change. For me, this raises a number of interesting questions that I think I'm exploring in my, uh, my hypertext adaptation of Monstrous Weather. What are we trying to uh, recapture or retell with these adaptations? How can we try to capture the experience of a collaborative performance? How faithful or authentic does an adaptation need to be? Who's the audience for such an adaptation? And maybe more importantly, do stories need to be retold to stay alive? And do we need stories to feel alive? Thank you for joining us for this introduction to climates of change and thinking about both the future of our planet and the future of the book itself. We hope you'll take some time to explore the works online and interact, generate, and imagine with us. Thank you.